the Ensemble podcast is intended for professional financial advisors. This content is created in partnership with our sponsor, T. Rowe, Price Australia Limited, ABN 13620-668-895, AFSL 503-741, and is limited to publicly available information. Before acting on any general advice, you should consider whether appropriate and obtain financial advice from a qualified financial advisor. Ensemble does not hold an AFS license and does not provide any financial advice or services or endorse any general advice. If a PDS or IM exists, you should obtain a copy and review it thoroughly before making a decision. How are you now? It's James Whelan here, Barclay Pierce Capital's Wealth Management Managing Director as a guest of the Ensemble platform and uh, and welcome as you are. Uh, today we are doing an absolutely special presentation uh, brought to you by T. Rowe Price. It's called The Great Broadening from AI and the MAG7 to Emerging Markets and Beyond. It's an absolute cracking episode that we've got ahead of us, so no more mucking around, let's get straight into it. In over 85 years, we've learned that change is the only constant and curiosity is key. That's why we have over 375 research professionals who go out in the field to get the answers we need. They dig in, studying companies and ideas firsthand, then use these insights to make investing decisions you can feel confident in. T. Rowe Price is a premier global asset management organisation, actively investing in opportunities to help people thrive in an evolving world. Welcome to part two of the special Ensemble podcast. Now, this is the second half of the big get before the Before the half, before the oranges, we talked to uh, Sam Ruiz, uh, investment specialist at T. Rowe Price. We talked about AI. We talked about the foundation of it being the, the, the reason for that huge bullish run that we've had in the MAG-7 stocks. Um, then we talked about the concentration risk that's uh, that's uh, that, that's in markets there at the moment that has been in there for, for most of the year. And then we talked about sort of what interest rate cuts from the Fed and, a, and now a rate cutting cycle around the world potentially, hopefully here as well, uh, means for, for markets and where you can start to see uh, the, the 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 reallocation of money away from uh, that mag seven, um, looking for better value, looking for everything like that. So we need someone, and and we did touch on emerging markets, which is important. So one of my favourite subjects on the, uh, is coming up as well. Fortunately, um, I'm not the one who's going to be able to take you through the emerging markets. Otherwise, it's really just going to be a conversation about India. So hopefully, we've got someone who can tell us uh, with a few more places, parts of the world. Uh, we've got Iona Dent, who is an associate portfolio manager for the Global Growth Equity Strategy. At T Rowe Price, Iona, Iona, I got it wrong. I'm so sorry, Iona. No problem, no problem. Thanks for having me, James. Great to great to meet you. That's okay. Look, uh, if you want me to do that intro again, I'll do it again. But otherwise, I uh, do apologise for that. Iona, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks, thanks for having me, James. I appreciate that. So, so you're in Baltimore at the moment, so that's why we're sort of talking on um, both of these ones. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah. I'm. Uh, well, our headquarters are in Baltimore. I spend my time between Baltimore and DC. Ah, very good, very good. Okay, so. Uh, th- th- it, it does mean that there's a difference between being in the room. I was in the room with Sam for the first half of the uh, of, of this podcast for the, for the first episode, and, and you can sort of tell a lot of the intonations and everything that needs to be done. So with this one, because we're um, we're over the wire, if you get if you get going on a subject, I'm not going to get in your way, okay, Ida. So uh, you just uh, you just you just carry on with some things. Now uh, we talked. Uh, first off, everyone gets the same question. You don't get a, you don't get out of this one either. Um, mm-hmm. What do you do, and how do you make money? Ah, oh, that's a that's a good starter. So I'm an associate portfolio manager um, on our global growth strategy. Um, so I work with portfolio manager Scott Burke, who's actually Aussie as well. And um, so it's pretty truly global in nature. You know, around thirty countries in our strategy of uh, any country, including frontier AEM, so very broad. I've been APM since January, actually. I joined at the beginning of this year. Um, on my side, I'm a bit more focused on global financials, consumer staples as well as emerging markets. And before that, I was a research analyst for essentially a, a decade, um, primarily in the EM banks. So I think I'm very lucky. I, I would say it's sort of the best job in the world if you like traveling and are curious about things and want to dive deep into more inefficient markets and make alpha. Um, that's essentially what I'm, I'm trying to do here. Do you want to draw that out a little bit there just with the inefficient markets um, in, the, in the quest for alpha, which is a, a noble quest. I've tried it once. It didn't go well. The... <laughs> The, uh, let's talk about the, the inefficient markets. So, so emerging, I mean, obviously with the emerging markets, I've always hated the fact that people bundle in EM into one basket. I actually yeah. find it, I actually find it a little bit offensive. How's, 
How's your definition? How do you separate? I, I've I've at times scored up to maybe five different emerging markets that I could basket up together. How do you how do you define and separate in your in your life? I couldn't agree more. I think it's so very. I mean, there are so many different ways that you can look at it. Whether it's from kind of the commodity importers to the commodity exporters, the kind of more service focused economies, the more manufacturing economies. But the more ways you try and look at it, the more you realize that every country is truly individual and has idiosyncratic drivers. And I think what's exciting about EM when I talk about inefficiencies, it's sort of in terms of the research process, right? So. Whereas if you look at Amazon or Apple, you'll have hundreds of analysts on the sell side modeling it, sending you notes, crawling through every note of the financial statement. When you get to EM, some of the markets I've looked at, there have been zero of analysts looking at the companies. Mm. Um, and it varies across across the regions. But I mean, Saudi Arabia is a good example. It only got upgraded into emerging markets uh, in about 2018. And at the outset, you couldn't get any information unless you went on the ground and you met management teams. If you sat at your desk and kind of looked at Bloomberg, honestly, you would be none the wiser as to the change that was going on on the ground. Um, so I couldn't agree more. It's it's very, very varied. And I don't think it's fair. I mean, even if you lump it into geographic kind of, okay, Asia and see me essentially Eastern Europe and Africa, Middle East, and then Latin, you know, I don't think that's doing it justice either. Mm. Now, I, I mentioned that Taiwan, Taiwan being bunched in with, with an emerging market is that is – Sort of one of those borderline ones for me, and definitely we'll, we'll get to China in a little while. But I wanted to talk about specifically just on Taiwan, specifically because I'm sort of drawing you into the idea with semiconductors. TSMC is obviously the, 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 the pretty colossal stock that they've got there. That is a part of of sort of what's underpinning all of this growth in this one. And I am obviously segueing pretty pretty horrendously on the on the direction towards making AI, which is the subject of this conversation, AI and EM. What? Yeah. Now, I mean, let, let's let's just let's just get straight to the question that we wanted to have answered first off, and see if we get to it, and then we might come back around to to see how we go. See, we'll, we'll draw some things out. How how is EM moving certain emerging markets? I know that's 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 pretty much that, that's the question that we wanted to answer anyway. You mean from an AI perspective? From an AI perspective, yeah. Yeah, sure. So, so the way I think about it is, in a way, EM is in a sense a factor of the ro- the world, right? So when there's a trend, whether it's AI or anything else, you know, when we look at the picks and shovels and the AI supply chain, EM certainly benefits and, and Taiwan, as you call out, is a key one. I mean, you have TSMC there, the sole manufacturer essentially of NVIDIA's AI GPUs, um, including the latest architectures like Blackwell. So as a result, it's also been a hot stock. Um, I think it's up more than 70% year to date, you know, not quite near the 150% of NVIDIA, right? But still being a great place to be. And on relative valuations, it's still cheaper, um, around 20 times forward earnings versus NVIDIA back near 30 times today. And with, you know, the share price supported by EPS upgrades. So, you know, I'm sure you had the debate with Sam as to where we are in this AI build out. And I think Satya Nadella and Microsoft makes the point that 10% of GDP was spent on railroads, um, railroads in the UK during the Industrial Revolution. So this CapEx cycle could have plenty further to go. Um, But the rate of change is likely slowing. What I'd say more generally when we think about EM and AI is it's kind of at this point, we're looking for the next leg of the thesis, right? And so we need to be looking beyond the direct ramifications, the obvious ones, um, starting to think about second order effects. So more around longer term potential productivity gains and revenue benefits for other industries and sectors like even financials or consumer and I think that speaks to where the market can broaden out from here, even within EM, um, but across the board. So I think it's early days, but that's something we're we're pretty excited about from here. Yeah, I, I think that there was an initial narrow view, and I will say it was a narrow view of thinking that, oh, well, AI is going to take the jobs of that cheap, over the phone, over the wire labor that you have in, in certain parts, South East yeah. Asia and India, for example. I, I disagree vehemently on that. Did, 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 would you like to have a stance on that one? I agree. I mean, actually, interestingly, we were in um, the Philippines earlier in the year, and and you know that's a key one for them. I met a lot of experts in this space, and I will say there were varied views, and often people kind of talk their book, right? But in general, people think it's going to create more efficiencies and and more productivity overall, um, and so you can have the same person handling more queries, but that doesn't necessarily mean you know the volume of queries can't expand as a result of it. So it depends on in demand, but I think. And, and uh, you know, I also in Vietnam, there's actually this this company, FBT, um, that's sort of an IT outsourcer. And from their perspective, 
it creates new projects, which is pretty exciting, helping companies get on board with this trend and, and get their data in order and everything. But it does make it a bit le- less labor intensive as well, so they can see the cost benefits. So I think, you know, as with all these mega trends, there's always a bull case, there's always a bear case, and, and probably the reality is somewhere in the middle. I, I, I think, yeah. Yeah, okay. I, I I actually think that anyone who thinks that there's going to be huge job losses, it, it, you clearly have just missed a, a bit of a jump on that one. I think that job job gains is probably the the, the way that I'd like to go with it. But let's not go down that path. The let's talk mm-hmm. about let's let's take a little trip around the world. If we want to start at the frontiers, now I I do like to dabble sometimes in, in those areas, and it's been um, there's a couple of couple of good little frontier ETFs which I've which I've played around with in the past. But is there anything? Let's let's go around the world in your expertise because I love to pick your brain on this on these things. Like you said, unless you've got someone on the ground, sometimes you don't know what's going on. Are there any frontier yeah. markets that you're seeing right now that are really exciting? So I think one of the ones that's most interesting for us would be Vietnam. Um, mm-hmm. It's one of the most dynamic economies in Southeast Asia. You know, you've seen kind of six to eight percent GDP growth for the last decade. And it's been pretty well diversified growth as well. Um, it's an export orientated economy. But again, quite diversified. So tech, people think about, but it's really electronics. It's also textiles, it's machinery, it's seafood. And there's been this huge FDI story due to a favorable investment climate, um, numerous trade agreements. I'd say it's benefiting from what's going on in China as well. So it's a very strategic location, a young workforce and and ongoing reforms aimed at enhancing sort of productivity and investment. I'd say it's been through a bit of a cyclical kind of tougher patch. Um, so 2022, well, first, actually, they had a tough COVID lockdown um, and that hurt the economy. And then you had these sort of shocks in 2022 to 2023, sort of tougher external demand. You actually had a bit of a, a liquidity crisis in the financial sector, um, including a deposit run and, and a bit of real estate turmoil and also a bit of an anti-corruption drive going on at a, at a political level. And actually, now we're seeing everything just start to turn. It's in this real sweet spot of sort of attractive EPS outlook, uh, recovering spending indicators, accelerating credit cycle with growth back in the mid-teens. Um, the corporate bond markets have reopened again and valuations are, are still pretty attractive. It's, it's doing well and it's improving, but it's still been slightly off people's radar. Uh, so I think for us, that's a, a really interesting one and it's definitely high up the, the priority list. Okay, that's, that's, a, that's a good case. Anything, so that's Vietnam. And so the single stocks that would be owned by your uh by your global growth strategy so we own fpt which is the one i mentioned in the in the tech space um and then we own some of the banks there as well so these are great banks delivering kind of high mid to high teen rres um and they aren't really seeing any asset quality pressures and yet they're trading you know some of them still near one times book so for us we think that's a pretty exciting space and then we've got a smaller play in, in consumer as well Okay, sure thing. Not to get too far into the weeds on these ones. Just interested with uh, with how it works structurally on these ones. It's better than just having a, a, a shotgun by the whole market approach that you sometimes get with uh, with ETFs. Or just speaking out loud, a hundred percent. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, anything else that you're seeing aside from that? You mentioned Saudi Arabia. Wait, it's are there any? Is there anything in the Middle East that you'd like at the moment? You know, Saudi Arabia to me, I think it's one of those interesting markets because I think it's honestly the most misunderstood still. Um, I could actually probably do a whole podcast on the economic and social transformation going on there. Uh, but in, in short, I guess they've realized they need to diversify away from oil, right? So under MBS, they have this Vision 2030, um, pretty aggressive economic and social targets, but they're generally on track to achieve them. And I actually, I first went to Saudi back in 2018, and it was a very different world, pretty strict. Uh, I had to go, you know, I wasn't allowed to go by myself as a woman, so I had to go with male colleagues. Um, In restaurants, I was separated from colleagues, you know, men and women weren't sitting together. And I would go to the executive floor to meet CEOs and and there wouldn't even be any female bathrooms to be seen, right? It just, it wasn't a thing. Now, and back then, that's because female labor participation was just 15%. Mm. Now, that's been a phenomenal story. It's actually hit 35%. Um, so more than double and over their 2030 target of 30% um, for the female labor force participation there. And so now I go to these conferences and I meet, you know, female management teams, but all I see very well-informed female investors. But it's, it's much broader than just a female story, right? So it's also about tourism, entertainment, infrastructure. And um, you might not think of Saudi as your go-to tourist destination, but they actually had 27 million international tourists 
uh, in 2023, so up more than 50% than pre-COVID. They've also got, you know, you might have read about these huge construction projects um, that they've committed nearly a trillion dollars to some of these projects. So Neon, for example, has been in the headlines, but much, much uh, broader than that as well. So as a result, it's sort of the most dynamic economy in the region from non-oil GDP growth perspective. Um, and because of this rate of change, it, it's my favorite country to visit in the region. And, um, you know, as I mentioned, also when I went in the past, there was no music or anything like that. Now you can, and I'd have to wear it and buy it. Now I can just go, you know, in a, in a usual dress and I can go to an open mic night or a concert. Um, in the financial sector, they've got this mortgage law that they've passed, which meant there's been this booming property market. And I guess from a technical perspective as well, it's a huge underweight. People haven't been paying attention to it. Positioning is light, but it's also a pretty nice diversifier uh, versus the rest of the EM. It's, it's lower beta and it's less correlated as well. Um, so I think that's a really interesting one that warrants people doing a bit more work on. Okay. Well, that's that's two fantastic ideas for us there. Thank you for that, Iona. Uh, now, we're just going to jump really quickly into the rate cutting cycle that we're seeing. And specifically, we're going to talk about I mean, emerging markets do have uh, a, a, without getting too detailed and technical on the whole thing, the US dollar does change the way that certain emerging markets work financially. Uh, with, you know, if, if, if they're as bullish a case that they should be or not, um, we've got a rate cutting cycle. We saw 50 basis points cut just recently by the Fed, uh, which not a lot of people were predicting, but there it is. And we're going to have more cuts through the, through the rest of the year. Before we get on to the other bigger end of the emerging market space, which I want to talk about India and China after this, but... How do you see those cuts and how do you see the leadership of the Fed with regards to, to this new leg on the cycle as as shaping the emerging market space? It's a great question because, honestly, I think you can't actually overstate the importance of the Fed and what they're doing and what that means for EM. I remember actually at, at the start of my career, I was doing an internship on a trading floor and I was on the EM team and the head trader said to me, you know, do you know what I want you to spend more than 50% of your time on in EM? I thought, oh, you know, I sort of just graduated, felt pleased with myself. And I thought, well, I know China is important for EM, so I'm sure it's China. It drives the commodity cycle, da da da. Please don't say that. And uh, <laughs> yeah, it was the Fed. <laughs> he said, he said, US economics, I want you to be paying more attention to that than any mm. EM country. Yeah. And uh, I mean, it's so true, right? Because the Fed rate impacts the cost of borrowing, it impacts the global interest rate cycle, therefore the global credit cycle and the global economic cycle, you know, capital flows, which is so important for EM, currency appreciation or depreciation, um, investment sentiment. So I, I don't think you can overstate the importance of it. And yeah, we've had this 50 bits rate cut, um, the first rate cut in four years after one of the sharpest hiking cycles in history. And I'd say it's hugely, uh, well, it, it, it's nuanced, but probably it's very positive for EM. And you can see that already in the in the performance last week, right? So MSCIM was up kind of 2.5% week on week in line with this cut, whereas DM was up 1.5% week on week. And I think this is just the beginning. We still have, or the market thinks, we still have close to 200 bits further cuts, um, which are priced through 2025. So, so the nuance I was referring to that I, I will just touch on is how this plays out, if you look at prior cycles, and again, each cycle is a bit different, but as it sort of depends on what happens in the US. So it's going to be a very good scenario for EM if we see a sort of softer landing in the US. Whereas if the US does see a recession, that's sort of tough across the board. EM can't escape that. Um, but one thing I'll point out as well is it's not just the level of rates. It's also the shape of the yield curve. And right now we've got a pretty steep yield curve, um, which kind of happens as, it, as we're seeing the front end ease. And typically that's also very good for EM out performance, because what it means is that investors expect stronger economic growth in the future, uh, as well as possibly, you know, rising inflation expectations. And actually moderate inflation is usually a pretty good backdrop for EM uh, when we think about corporate earnings, et cetera. And then just the, the last kind of brief point I'll make on this is what traditionally comes with the Fed easing is a weak dollar. Again, depends on the cycle. There are always nuances here. But if you look historically, in the last six season cycles, the dollar has, has traditionally, on average, recorded a decline. And emerging assets almost always outperform on a relative basis when the dollar is depreciating. So I think that's a really, a really helpful setup too. Yep. No, and, and I could see that too. All things being equal, the US dollar should should theoretically come off. A lot of other things. Yeah. There's always another side to that, to that coin, if you'll excuse the pun. Uh, <laughs> on that. 
Thank you for the courtesy laugh. It means a lot. Uh, so <laughs> we we now before okay. So let's head into the big uh, into the big players now. The big names. Recently, I was interviewed by uh, was a, a Hong Kong radio station just before Chinese regulators were set to come on and and, and say something that seemed like it was important. James, what do you think they're going to uh, what do you think they're going to do? I say, well, you know what? There's been a lot of talk recently. I really don't think they're going to do that much with regards to stimulus for their own economy. I think that the focus for China is probably going to be more on. Uh, more on, on on making sure they're protected in their in their semiconductor space and their technological space to make sure that they're um, they're immune from any attacks from the US in this political cycle. I could not have been more wrong <laughs> ever with this extraordinary uh, stimulus that's, that that the Chinese uh, have announced that they're coming out with. It just seems to have put a floor underneath their market substantially, and I hope that it does continue on. What do you see? With regards to, I mean, with with the fact that the landscape has changed a bit in, in China recently, if we we're doing this a few weeks ago, we'd probably be talking a different story. Where do you see China at the moment? And and then we'll, we'll get into the weeds of the AI side of things with regards to China and the semiconductor space. Sounds good. I mean, I think the first thing I'd say is, you know, you're definitely not the first person to have been caught out on China. In <laughs> fact, I think if any investor told me that they had a perfect track record in China, I, I frankly just wouldn't believe them. Um, <laughs> but I think your bit. point, Thank you for that. yeah, no, 100%. I think, you know, this links back to the prior point actually about Fed easing. I don't think it's a coincidence that the Fed cut last week and then we got this news right. So the Fed easing has almost certainly made space for them to do this. So on the one hand, I think it's kind of thesis confirmation that lower rates is generally good for EM. But if we look at what happened, I mean, some of it was expected, right? So we got rate cuts kind of across the board. We got the repo rate cut. We got reserve requirements cut. But I would say it's worth highlighting it's the first time they cut the policy rate and the reserve requirements on the same day in the past decade. So, so it does underscore the urgency here. And then you got this kind of 1% or so of GDP stimulus on the property and credit side, and then another half a percent or so on the stocks kind of swap program. Mm. So, so to your point that we would have had a different conversation a month or so ago, you know, I think it was needed. The latest macro data has been pretty depressing um, on both growth and inflation. And leading indicators were suggesting further downside risk. I think the issue, though, is this is more of a kind of monetary stimulus package. And, and from a macro perspective, the problem is that the Chinese economy, it, it's not lacking liquidity, but it's lacking demand. So it's a bit like during COVID when the Fed cut, but in reality, people aren't going to go and buy houses you know, with lower rates at the outset when they're not sure if they still have a job. Of course, that changed when the fiscal stimulus then came through. So I think what, what's missing still in China is the fiscal stimulus. Uh, the monetary transmission mechanism is a bit broken. Really, we still got this demand deficit, you know, this broken housing market, and a loss of confidence. And IMF, I think, thinks the property sector is is going to be a drag on GDP into the 2030s at this rate. So perhaps something will follow on the fiscal front. I, I don't want to. I think that is a possibility. Um, but in reality, I think we need something in the order of kind of five to ten percent of GDP that we saw in in two thousand nine or two thousand and fifteen and sixteen. What what I will say though, what I thought was almost the most interesting um, was a swap and buyback facility on the equity side. And and actually, if you look at the price side, very very similar mm. to to actual markets. Sorry, go go into that. I jumped. I jumped in. Yeah, yeah. No, I agree. I mean, if you look at the price action throughout the press conference, it was actually only when this came out that the market started moving. Right. So. Some on the ground think that officials now really care about the stock market. Um, and there would be a notable change in tone after, you know, a series of regulatory clampdowns. And it would be also pretty important in the context of the fact that people are underinvested. So I think mutual funds in aggregate have kind of 5% allocation in Chinese equities, um, which is only first percentile over the past decade. So active mutual fund mandates clearly are underweight China. And if they really care about the stock market, I think the jury's still out on that. But that could be a big tailwind. So I view if you can't ignore China, you know, it is cheap, um, nine times P, I think, in aggregate for the market, including some decent companies that are growing well. The focus on shareholder return is, is coming through. You're getting more supportive kind of divvy and buyback yields. And it's, it's 18% of the world's population, right? But to your point, the geopolitical risks are real. I actually today was at this um, really interesting kind of few sessions at the Senate in DC. And, you know, it, it is bipartisan, the views on China uh, from the US. So that is a risk that can't be ignored. No, it's, and I, I agree. I think that with, if, if I could just throw in my two cents on this one, because yeah, that's, absolutely. That's, 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 that's what I do. I think that with regards to the stock market, and, and there's a few things just to say on this one. 
you can be you can be as right as possible. There's something that I need to train my guys as much as I possibly can on these on these things. So like your thesis can be right, you can be right all day, but if you don't have the money flow into that particular thesis, then there's no point in having it. You were mentioning earlier about about frontier markets and some of the markets that great value, great companies, great anything. But unless unless there's actually people that are buying these things, and the thesis means nothing. And that's sort of that next stage that that, that you guys specialize in, and sometimes a lot of people do forget. With a hundred percent agree, yeah. But yeah, you can you can be right. You can be right, and the stock still goes down. You can be right, the market still goes yeah. down. This it's it yeah. does happen. You're not. It, it doesn't count as being right um, unless you have <laughs> the money flow going into it. Okay, so now let's let's get to the big one, the mother and my, and my favorite market. I've been bullish India for uh, a few years now, based on my thesis. But we're not here to hear my thesis. Um, where do you see India on this one, especially with regards? I mean, the the, the tech growth in India and and factories having their second. Well, I won't jump in. Iona, India. Go. <laughs> no, you're laying out the you're laying out the pieces very nicely. I mean, I mean, you've been right, and uh, it's actually a trade that we've been on too. I mean, if you look at the past decades, India's outperformed China by a hundred percent, which is pretty astonishing. And last year they overtook China in terms of population. This year they've actually now overtaken China in the weight and EM index. And and you know to the China conversation, I'd say India is almost the mirror image of China right now in terms of the growth, in terms of demographic support, in terms of the property market, um, and in terms of geopolitics, which is actually kind of working in their favor, driving strong supply chain alliances. I mean, I was in India actually earlier this year, and someone jokes that India is the only place where the PM can simultane- simultaneously um, import Russian oil and still be invited to the White House for dinner. So they, they've managed to, yeah, exactly. They've managed to navigate this pretty impressive, uh, impressive situation. But you know, I think the structural support is that it wasn't always this way, right? I mean, it was part of the fragile five um, back ten plus years ago, and now it's one of the strongest economies that we follow. And it had a tough COVID, but it's had this great recovery, recovery coming through, and it's mm. the fastest growing large economy, essentially. Um, I think it's set to become the third biggest economy soon. It's it's overtaken Germany and Japan. Uh, it's always it's already actually overtaken my home country, the the UK. Um, and I think the context here is important, and, and this is more a near term point. But I mean, one reason they had a pretty tough pandemic was because of the monetary and fiscal discipline that they're showing now. So the flip side of that was we've seen more benign inflation and, and rates than we saw in many DMs and other EMs as well. And they're just being a, a lot more disciplined versus, well, both their own history and versus peers. But but to a broader point as well, they're seeing, yeah, a lot of benefit on the on the FDI point. Um, they have a lot going for them and MNCs are relocating there. They have a high-skilled workforce, but obviously still a relatively attractive cost of labor. Um, and more generally, they've had these great big bang reforms from Modi coming through. I mean, you had the GST, the goods and services tax now driving tax collections way ahead of expectations. So it's still paying off. You know, that was a few years back. And it's really a virtuous cycle because that then gives the government more spending power. And primarily, they're spending that on infrastructure. And um, so it's really good long-term mindset. And, you know, it's uh, it's one of our favorite economies when you look purely at fundamentals. I would say valuations are the one thing that means, you know, it's hard to be all in on it right now. I think it's the most expensive market actually in the world. Um, on on an absolute valuation, partly supported by high REs, um, and some of that broth is more in the small and the mid cap space. You've got some pretty attractive looking large caps at the same time. So again, you have to dig deep into the market here and, and check out the nuances. But they've done a fantastic job from a structural reform perspective, cleaning up the corporate, the banking sector balance sheet, this bankruptcy reform, and again, opposite to China, I'd say you know consumer gearing is very low and corporate gearing is also low. So they're sort of Underinvested versus China being somewhat overinvested. I, I think with the valuations, and a lot of people have thrown that at me as well on the valuation side of things. And if you're looking at the straight valuation, then yes, technically you do. But I think that India is one of those rare rare occasions when the economy and the market are actually side by side uh, in lockstep. That because you've got the systematic investment plans and a growing middle class, you have people. It's effectively, it's like our superannuation industry, but it's all because it's a yeah. market. The money just has to stay inside, so it goes straight to the funds and straight to the ETFs. Those funds and ETFs have to buy the underlying stocks. Everything keeps growing. Everything keeps spinning. The fat Labrador chest gets tail up the stairs, as I've said before. So, um, I think no, that's a really good point. And an equity culture, you know, is rising. But actually, I think there are no major concerns. And you look at the rise in household leverage. 
it's among the lowest still uh, across large markets and mm. still less than 5% of household ha- wealth is invested in equities. And, and that compares to sort of 40% in the US. So I agree with you. I mean, that that I think will take some time um, and can still come through. And actually foreign investors are underinvested. So really it has been a great domestic story, but foreign investors have looked at valuations and ignored it and, and then regretted it for the most part. I can only tell people so many times, uh, Iona. <laughs> <laughs> you, can't, you can't force me into it. The, uh, now, I, whilst we're on this subject, I, I, I want to keep on going into India because you mentioned having people on the ground uh, in the weeds, getting into the thick of it, that you need to see some things. Recently, uh, you know, one or two Indian stocks have had some pretty damning short reports come out on them. Are you seeing now, whilst you mentioned reform and, and banking reform, some of these have got auditors that maybe seemed a little bit, a little bit thin, on the ground, how are you? I mean, the, the, the work that you're doing there into, into single stock names is pretty thorough, I can imagine. Yes, that's correct. I'd say for the most part, well, across the board, really, a lot of our analysts have um, either accounting backgrounds of some kind or financial backgrounds, and often we'll get in specialist accountants if there's any red flags to them on the on the financial statements as they call through them. And mm. um, so, fortunately, we haven't been exposed to any of those kind of. Short, those ones that have been impacted by the short reports. I mean, there's always uh, sometimes indirect questions that come about when you have exposures to the banks in India, for example. You know, if there's a big short report or some questions going around, you then have to go and dig in the bank's balance sheets and look at their loan book and see where their exposures are and see what collateral they might have against what projects and kind of where they sit in the hierarchy. Um, uh, but the thing about an Indian management teams, I'd say, is when you meet them, they're, they're almost always bullish. And to be fair, it is a fantastic story, but I'd say they're not the best at telling you the bad news. So <laughs> what I think our team is very good at is is taking what they say with a pinch of salt as well and always kind of triangulating the evidence and doing their own due diligence and speaking to customers, speaking to clients, um, you know, even looking at glass door reviews, saying what employees have to say, um, doing GLG calls with individuals who used to work at the firms and, and have left. And um, so it's a, a pretty lengthy due diligence process. Yeah, well, that's that's good to know then. As uh, as opposed to, like I said, just the scattergun approach of just buying the market um, via an ETF or something like that. So that's it's much more specific and targeted uh, through the global growth equity strategy. Okay, that's that. That's sort of the, the too blunt, uh, too blunt a statement on that one, unfortunately. So it's good. I again, I, I really don't have that much to go through here anymore. I don't know. Have you got anything else you want to touch on around the world? I feel like I've done. Yeah, I mean, I'll, I guess I'll add a few things. Um, <laughs> I mean, maybe maybe one is just on EM itself as an asset class. I mean, outside of what's happening in in Fed uh, the Fed rate cycle, which I think is a huge driver. You know, I think we're at a really good starting point in EM in terms of earnings growth. And and if you look at GDP growth differential, global GDP growth is broadening, so this helps with the broadening theme. Um, the EM GDP growth premium over DM is expanding. Um, you know, it was around two and a half percent last year. It's expected to be heading towards three percent this uh, this year in 2024. And actually, from next year, I read in the FT that that more than 80 percent of emerging countries are expected to have GDP per capita growth ahead of the US, um, up for about half in the in the past few years. So that's really encouraging. And then we're seeing good EM EPS revisions, um, particularly outside of China. You know, I'd call out Indonesia and, and Philippines as great ones there. And then we're starting with these valuations of at least 35% lower on a forward P basis than DEM. Um, some of that is skewed, you know, by this weighting to China, which, as we discussed with the imploding real estate sector, doesn't help. So maybe that somewhat flatters comparisons. Okay. But if you consider historical ranges, you know, the US is at the very top end of their, their valuation range, whereas EM is kind of mid historical range, despite an improving um, earnings outlook and pretty low invested positioning, I'd say. A lot of people have kind of given up on EM after a top 10 years. Um, so for us, that feels like a pretty a pretty good starting point. You often make money being contrarian in the end. That is, that is true. It's when everyone just gives up that all of a sudden it's there. I have often been the giver up and I've, I've often been the, <laughs> charger, the, the charger in uh, on those ones as well. And I'm just sort of taking away from what Sam said uh, Sam said in the first half with regards to how much the, the, the Magnificent Seven, so that concentration risk in the US market, how much higher their earnings beats were than yeah. the other 493 stocks, that's now going to, to become much shallower. The crocodile jaws will, will clamp shut, so there won't be as as much benefit to be had in those seven stocks, um, which will dissipate yeah. and not be called the seven anymore, I'm sure. Uh, and so as you find things, 
as you find other things to go into, off going offshore is absolutely a, a, a place that you want to do with regards to diversity, with regards to valuations, with regards to just capturing innovation and growth where uh, where it wasn't before. Um, Completely agree. And, and I think I what's up? really, yeah, no, no, 100%. And I think what's really encouraging is, you know, we're kind of talking theoretically about this broadening out as if it's sort of in the future. But actually, we're already seeing evidence of this start to happen, right? So if you look at on a geographic basis, post, I'd say July, if you go back to July, we had the soft CPI print, right? And that was when everyone said, okay, Fed's going to cut, Fed's going to cut. And people started talking about a 50 bits cut. And since the expectations moved there, we've already seen Indonesia, you know, up nearly 20% in dollar terms since the beginning of July. And we've seen the Philippine Stock Exchange Index up over 22%. Some of the local banks up well over thirty percent, and that's just in a couple of months. We actually had a very timely visit. We were there in in July, but had you looked at a share price chart, then it would have told a hugely different story. It was unloved; people were uninterested. Liquidity was bad. You know, locals who again are often contrarian indicators were saying, "This is never going to turn. There's nothing interesting to see here." Where in practice, rates have been a key driver, and and they've been cut, and that's helping improve cost of equity and, and improve the market. And at the same time, these markets being up twenty percent, you know, S and still done okay, but it's been up five percent. Um, so I think that's that's really important to flag as well. Some of this is starting to happen already. Okay. Well, on that note, I'm I'm happy to close it off there, unless there's any uh, any last bits. No, I think that's it. If you think you've got enough content, I mean, the only other one I think is interesting possibly to talk about is Argentina. Oh, uh, sorry. sorry, yes. Oh, because I mean, as a libertarian myself, um, <laughs> proud libertarian myself. This guy's uh, this guy's really supercharged it, hasn't he? Um, go, please. Yeah. Just, uh, Argentina, good. This is another another great idea here. Well, it, it is true. I mean, he really has supercharged it, and it's something we, we didn't see, think we'd see happen so quickly. And what's phenomenal, so, so Mille, you know, he really has done a lot in a short space of time. And all these key things, when we think about EM and the framework and what we look for from a macro perspective in particular and imbalances, you know, you look at the budget deficit, you look at external deficits, of course, you look at inflation as well. And in a short space of time, he's done a very good job three. So he's brought the budget from deficit, over 5% fiscal deficit back into surplus. Um, external deficits have have essentially disappeared, the current account, 3% on the eve of elections, and the economy is that on surplus. And then the big one for, for locals in particular, given the pain they've been feeling, is headline CPI inflation. And, you know, the headline rate is still around 250%. So it's, it's not a great look still, I will grant you. Um, but actually, if you look into the details, there's been a complete collapse in month-on-month sequential inflation. So it's fallen to only around 65% on an annualized basis, and um, which allowed our government to slash rates. I mean, they were 130% when he took office, and now they're down to 40%. Mm. And, and I think what's pretty incredible about this market is that he's done this while maintaining his popularity. Because um, traditionally, you know, a lot of governments, they come in, they try and impose fiscal discipline and poof, they get boosted out pretty quickly because people decide they don't like it. I, I mean, I would say they're not out the woods yet. The exchange rate is still pegged. We've got this kind of fixed 2% monthly cool rate, um, which isn't ideal. But I think he's doing the right thing, getting the house in order before he addresses that. So it's 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 a risky one. It's one where a lot of investors have been hurt before. And as a result, valuations are pretty attractive. And, you know, bondholders have been hurt in the past as well. But it's one where I'd say we're seeing encouraging green shoots. Yeah. Okay. Well, that, that's one to look out for. I mean, if we've got three ideas that are there, we've got Vietnam, Saudi Arabia, and, and Argentina for the green shoots. But you've got to be specific. You've got to be active. Um, you can't just take a scattergun approach at it. And the global growth the global growth equity strategy at T-Row Price is probably worth a look, I would say, based on this conversation that we've had with Iona Dent, who is an associate portfolio manager for the T. Rowe Price Global Growth Equity Strategy. Thank you for joining us today, Iona. Fantastic. Thank you so much for having me, James. Okay. Uh, thank you. And you have joined us for this special ensemble podcast. My name is James Whelan, Managing Director of the Barclay Pierce Capital's Wealth Management Team and a humble servant of the Ensemble crew. If you need any more information, go and check it out on the platform at Ensemble and uh, or talk to the guys there. They'll be happy to help you out. My name is James. Thanks very much. Have a great day. <laughs>